What's up everybody, if you that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grow It, and I'm back with another Q&A video. I decided to make this Q&A video more topic focused. This particular topic that we're gonna go over questions for is LED grow lights. I was thinking about doing other types of topics in the future, whether it be questions in regards to the seedling stage, questions in regards to plant training, questions in regards to feeding, so on and so forth. So if you have ideas for which one I should tackle next, let me know down in the comment section below. Before we get into this video, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Mars Hydro. Mars Hydro currently has a 35% off summer sale going on for certain items. The prices are already decreased on their website and you can stack my discount code on top of it to save more. Their FC series of grow lights, which are bar style, are one of the more popular lights, as well as their FCE series, another bar style, but the bars are removable, so you can actually customize how the bars are placed on the fixture. Stock is limited, so when they sell out, the sale will end. First to buy, first to save. The website and discount code are on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, and I'll also provide this information in the description section below. Okay, now let's get into the questions. How much does PAR matter compared to environment, nutrients, soil, genetics? One could argue that it's the most important thing. Now, I personally think that genetics is gonna be your baseline, right? You wanna go after genetics first in regards to what you're looking for, whether it be a high yielding strain, specific terpene profile, cannabinoid profile, so on and so forth. Then from there, lighting. Now, some could argue that nutrition, environment are pretty equal there when it comes to what's gonna give you a high yield, right? If you don't have one, then it could certainly impact the other. But yeah, lighting is definitely one of the most important things when it comes to plant growth. If you give your plant too much light, it could do harm such as light burn, slow down overall growth. If you don't give your plants enough light, lower than optimal, then you're just not gonna see the growth that you would if it did have optimal light. Should I use the California Lightworks 400 watt in my 4x4 for full veg and flower? Yeah, absolutely, that is a full spectrum light. I believe you're talking about the Solar Extreme 500. I know that one is 400 watts, that's why I mention it. I actually had my hands on that before. I did a uh, unboxing video on it, then I did a separate PAR test video on it. In my opinion, I definitely think you would get better results running two in that grow space. Uh, when I took the PAR measurements, I really felt like uh, that particular light would be more suited for a two foot by four foot grow space. So I think two of those in a four foot by four foot grow space would be great. Now there are people that reached out to me before and told me that they do run it in a four by four and they get some great results and I've seen videos of it. So um, yeah, try it out. I don't think it would be harmful if you added in another light in that space. That's just my opinion. Next few questions are kind of similar. Do you increase the intensity over its different stages? and how high should you adjust the dimmer on your light for each stage of your plant's life? So I've gone over this a bunch of times in a bunch of videos in the past, so I'll quickly just go over it here. Looking at PAR measured in PPFD, 200 to 400 PPFD is generally what I aim for for seedlings, clones, and mother plants, 400 to 600 PPFD for plants in the vegetation stage, and 600 to 900 PPFD for plants in the flowering stage. Now, if you're supplementing CO2, you can go a bit higher than that. And if you don't have a PAR meter, so you can't really dial in that distance by using a meter, most people, what they'll do is they'll look at the PAR chart that the grow light company releases. It's usually on the grow light listing, or you can reach out to the manufacturer and ask them for a PAR chart. And you can use the PAR chart information to help dial in that light distance. So you're getting those uh, specific PAR ranges during the different stages of growth. Is it true that you achieve better results in 75 to 85, unlike HPS at 65 to 75 degrees? So the reason why it's generally recommended to run a bit higher of a temperature when you're using LED grow lights is because with HPS lights, they have IR that kind of radiates down and it increases the canopy temperature more than an LED grow light would. That's why it's generally recommended between 65 to actually 80. I've heard some people going up to 82 with HPS versus you hear a lot of people doing LEDs up to up to 85, some even 87. I've tried 87 degrees in the past. Some cultivars can take it. Others, uh, you could see some stress happening uh, in my experience. 
These days I'm typically aiming for a certain leaf surface temperature. If you kind of get deep into it, leaf surface temperature is the more accurate way to kind of measure what your plant should be at. 80 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit leaf surface temperature is what I've had best luck on. That's kind of what I've read to be ideal. And I've seen that uh, certain cultivars are able to take that. If I go higher than that, 83, 84, there are some cultivars that just, you see the stress happening. Then of course, if you're lower than that, you're potentially sacrificing uh, growth. Will a LED last longer if it's kept cool, i.e. pointing a fan directly at the heat sinks? So I actually heard that same thing from Dan from the Green Sunshine Company. He had recommended pointing a fan at the heat sink to blow off some of that heat off the heat sink. Dan said that yes, the fixture should last longer. You should get a longer lifespan out of that fixture if you're blowing off some of that heat off of the heat sinks. But for the most part, if the heat sink is built for the amount of heat coming off of those diodes, you shouldn't have to. But I don't think it would hurt. I think it would help. So yeah, I mean, if you're doing that right now, I don't think it would hurt to continue doing that. How do you know what level to set the dimmer and the height during the different stages? That's a great question. Not all LED grow lights are created equal. A lot of these fixtures have dimmers on them now, so you can uh, dim them down, reduce the amount of energy you're consuming, and also allows you to bring the light fixture closer to the plants. So if you're having height restrictions, for example, it helps to dim things down and get the light closer. But every light is different, so it's impossible for me to say, okay, you're gonna set it to 25% at this height distance. Then when the plant grows to this stage, you're gonna increase it to this percentage on the dimmer and this light distance. It's just, it's impossible for me to tell you. My recommendation is to look at the PAR chart and you're gonna have to do some monkey math or reach out to the manufacturer and find out if there's certain dim levels that get you to a certain amount of PAR. And also it's gonna depend on which plant you're growing. Different plants have different lighting requirements. Is LED side lighting worth it? Ah, that's a great question. Um, I did get my hands on some side lighting uh, actually last year. I got the Chilled Growcraft X1 and also I got the Chilled Growcraft X1 Mini. I didn't actually use it as side lighting, so I'm not really speaking from experience here. I used it as a regular grow light actually, and it worked pretty good. I think this is a debatable topic. I think that a lot of people are gonna say no. And I think a lot of people are gonna say that the lighting that you have over your plants is gonna be enough for it. I'm trying to think of a situation where it would be beneficial. Maybe if you're in a grow room and the grow light you're using doesn't really cover your entire plant, or entire grow space and you kind of have some side lighting over there to compensate for that miss. But for the most part, I really feel like you're gonna be fine with just a regular grow light and that uh, you probably wouldn't get much more out of it with the side lighting. That's just my opinion. What do you think about the Vivo Sun VS1000 or Vivo Sun VS1000? So I actually used two of these in a two foot by four foot grow space. They work pretty good. I don't have any complaints. Uh, I did look at the grow light listing pretty recently and I feel like they overstate the coverage area. I personally think that this light would be best suited for a two foot by two foot grow space when we're talking about flowering coverage area. Probably three foot by three foot if you're in the veg stage. But yeah, two of those in a two foot by four foot space would be great. I think one of them in a two foot by two foot grow tent would be great. I definitely think there are better fixtures on the market today. I'm actually working on updating the best LED grow light articles that I have. Uh, some of you are familiar with that. Every year I have an article that I update which shows the best fixtures for different size grow spaces. This particular fixture did not make it on the best LED grow light list for two foot by two foot space. So just to give you a heads up on that one. If you wanna check out that list of the best LED grow lights, go to my website, mrgrow.com, click on articles, and then it's under grow room and nutrients. I would link it in the description section. However, YouTube does not like my website, so I don't post my website in the description section. What do you think about the Mars Hydro SP3000? I seen Rob said it was great for the price. I think that light is awesome. In a two foot by four foot grow space, one of those would be great. I got my hands on two of them in the past and I put them in a four foot by four foot grow tent and did some part measurements there and it looks, they looked really, really good. If you space them out a little bit, you can get really even coverage across the entire canopy there. So that plus the components that they're using are high quality. They're using Samsung diodes, meanwhile driver. Uh, yeah, I don't think you can go wrong with that. I think this is one of the more affordable options on the market today and uh, definitely worth it for sure. If you're on a budget, this is a great light for you. 
why haven't you been using them all along? <laughs> That's a good question. So I started growing back in 2010, so 11 years. And I really wasn't introduced to LED grow lights until like, I think 2013-ish. And back then, a lot of them were just terrible. <laughs> a lot of the LED grow lights created back then were actually less efficient than HPS. But they've come a long way, for sure. I actually switched over to LED back in 2015 and I've been using it ever since. I don't have anything against HPS, MH, any HID grow lights, nothing against them at all. I just, I personally use LED and I prefer LED. Can light stress be a good thing in small amounts? How much can you push it? I personally don't think that any light stress is good. I've had light stress on several plants in the past. I mean, with these LED grow lights coming out these days, it's so easy to burn your plants. The moment I start seeing any signs of light stress, I'll increase the distance of my grow light or I'll dim it down so it's not as intense on the plants. Now, speaking about my experience and my observations, I feel like it did negatively impact bud structure a little bit with that additional light. So I personally avoid light stress at all costs. What temps should you run at different stages? Some say leaf temp is lower than HPS. Yeah, so we kind of touched on that in an earlier question in regards to the HPS kind of increasing the, the leaf temp. But temp I usually aim for, leaf temp 80 to 82 degrees throughout the entire grow. That's for, for seedlings. I mean, I'm not as worried about it when the plant is seedling or young veg. Some would argue that it's safer to kind of go on the lower side of that. But yeah, 80 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit leaf surface temp is what I usually aim for. Our HPS equivalents BS. I think back in the day they might have been useful, but I personally don't have any need for them anymore. I think there's a lot of manufacturer, particularly some of these grow lights you see on Amazon, that they're exaggerating what their HPS equivalents are. I mean, there are some lights really that pull 100 watts from the wall, and they say it's an equivalent of a 1,000 watt HPS, which is just... I mean, that's BS. So when talking about HPS equivalents, seeing those mentioned on listings, that's something I don't really pay attention to at all. What's the life expectancy of LEDs? Well, not all LED grow lights are created equal. Different diodes, different drivers are gonna impact the lifespan of the fixture. Not sure if you're talking about the diodes in itself or if you're talking about the fixture in a whole. In most grow light listings, you should see a life expectancy number. 50,000 hours is what I see on a lot of lights. But yeah, it's gonna be different depending on which LED fixture you're looking at. Are Spider Farmer and Mars Hydro the same company? That's the rumor. I have heard that in the past. Uh, I can't confirm it. I work with both of those companies, uh, Spider Farmer. I have a different contact than I do with Mars Hydro, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was a parent company and then a bunch of other LED like brands underneath it. I mean, that's pretty common across several niches. Got a couple questions in regards to the next one. Bars versus quantum boards. Thoughts on quantum boards versus new bar style. Are flat boards outdated? I don't think uh, flat boards are outdated. It's kind of funny to, to hear that. Be like, uh, the flat quantum boards or LED boards outdated. By the way, the word quantum board is trademarked by HLG, Horticultural Lighting Group. So no, the company should be using quantum board. But LED boards, uh, what they're often referred to, flat board. I think that might be the first time I heard of flat board. I don't think they're outdated. I think they have a place here. I think the bar style beats the LED boards or quantum boards, uh, hands down when it comes to light spread. A lot of people, what they look for is an even light spread across the footprint. And with the quantum boards, the light is really focused in the center of the footprint with a lot of grow lights. So it has that dead center focus. And then if you look at the part chart, you'll see that the hard numbers will drop off as it gets to the edges of the footprint. With the bar style light, you're gonna get a much even footprint across the canopy. And that's one reason why that I prefer those bar styles versus the quantum boards. Although I use both. I use the SF2000 LED grow light by Spider Farmer. I've used the chilled Growcraft X3 in the past. That's a bar style light. But yeah, I wouldn't say that the LED boards are outdated. I would say that the bar style lights definitely has the upper hand when it comes to light spread. Have you experienced light burn? Got a tent with all plants turning yellowish. Yep, absolutely have experienced light burn in the past uh, several times. Like I mentioned earlier, it's so easy to burn your plants these days with a lot of these grow lights. But yeah, light burn, you know, you start to see it at the top of the plant, works its way down. I actually do have a full article on light burn on my website. If you go to mrgrow.com, click on articles and then plant problems. There is an article on light burn with a lot more information about light burn, but yeah, I've experienced it before and it is no fun. 
Are Blurple lights really that bad? Not cheap Amazon Blurple LEDs, but quality ones. There are lighting scientists out there that are gonna argue that photons are photons. They're gonna say it's more about light density, the amount of light versus spectrum. Now with the Blurple lights, it had a targeted spectrum. There's a lot of blue and a lot of red, minimal green, Maybe there's some UV, maybe there's a little bit of IR, but the plant will still grow. It might not be optimal. You're gonna get people who are gonna say that full spectrum of light is the best. I would personally agree with that. However, I wouldn't rule out the blurple lights as being something you shouldn't grow with at all. If you have it, grow with it. Just try to get that density of photons or that par, get that at the right levels for the different stages of growth, like I talked about earlier, and you should be able to get some good results. So no, I wouldn't say that all blurple lights are bad. What's your choice of light for a four x four? So I personally, um, instead of buying a light intended for a four x four, a four x four flowering coverage area, I personally prefer to run two lights in that grow space. So two separate lights in that grow space with a flowering coverage area of two feet by four feet. I like to have two lights in that space because you just have that flexibility. So I personally grow all different cultivars from seed. And as many of you may know, each seed is its own pheno. You can have different growth on those plants. So I'll get some plants that will stretch up like crazy. So having the flexibility to raise one light on one side of the footprint, keeping the other light down for the smaller plants, I personally found that to be beneficial. And also it does sometimes help with energy consumption as well, right? I've had grow lights that I've ran that um, didn't have a dimmer on it. So I'm running the light full power, 600 watts or whatever it may be for small plants in the seedling stage. But having two separate lights in there and even if I didn't have a dimmer on it, I could at least cut the energy consumption in half for seedlings, for example. But yeah, I really like to have two grow lights in that grow space for flexibility purposes. What happened with your Maxi Sun sponsorship? It's complete. Um, so I actually, for those that don't know, I did a sponsorship with Maxi Sun. I did a, a video on my main channel where I talk about the different fixtures that they have. And then I also did uh, individual park test videos on the fixtures that they sent me on my second YouTube channel, which is this YouTube channel right here. I actually took all of those videos down. And the reason why I did is because I was getting comments of people mentioning that they've upgraded their fixture. So they upgraded the components on the inside. So the information that was said within the videos uh, were no longer applicable. So that's the only reason why I took down those videos is just because it, the information is no longer correct in there. I didn't wanna leave up those videos and spread misinformation or outdated information. So I don't have anything against those lights. I think those lights are fantastic. And yeah, that's what happened with that sponsorship. Is it ever okay to have your plants closer to the LED grow lights than the manufacturer recommends? Yes, but uh, it's gonna be very rare. A lot of the good grow light companies, they're gonna give you a PAR chart to go by and those PAR charts are gonna be accurate. So in that case, you can go by the manufacturer's recommendation. Now, unfortunately, there are a lot of grow light companies out there, particularly you'll find them on Amazon where they only give you the dead center number, for example, of, of PAR, this, this one measurement right in the dead center of the footprint and that's it. I have found instances where those measurements were actually incorrect. Some grow light companies won't hesitate to lie to you and exaggerate numbers. So yeah, if you have an LED grow light from a company that isn't well known, or maybe they're not showing all of their PAR numbers on their PAR chart, that might be a case where having the grow light closer would be beneficial. But for the most part, most of these LED grow light companies, they're gonna have accurate measurements for you that you can go by. I got several people asking this question. CalMag supplements for using LED grow lights. Why is it needed? What is the purpose? Will LED lights cause a deficiency in plants requiring additives like CalMag? Should you supplement calcium under LED, specifically in living soil? Why do I see some people having CalMag problems after switching over to LEDs? So this was a question that was actually asked the most, and I don't think I have the best answer for you, but I'll try to answer this. So way back in the day when I was using HPS lights, I was able to get away with just using the Fox Farm trio of nutrients. So for those that don't know, Fox Farm has a trio. They've got, it's a three bottle nutrient line and I could use just those three bottles for the entire grow and my plants would be fine. Now, particularly when I switched over to LED grow lights, I found that I was coming across calcium deficiency in particular. And talking with people, you know, back then on forums, people just said that you need CalMag supplement to be added whenever using LED. And I'm not sure if any science has come out on this one or not, but I don't think we actually know the true reason why that is. The true reason why you need to supplement CalMag when using LED. 
It may just be because the density of photons is greater or it could have something to do with the spectrum. I don't think we truly know why that is the case. I think that's more of a question for a lighting scientist. I'm actually looking to get a lighting scientist onto my podcast in the future, my Garden Talk with Mr. Grove podcast. And that's definitely a question I will ask them. But yeah, wish I had a better answer for you just for some reason when using LEDs, most I don't know if it's cultivar specific or, or what, but having CalMag on hand to add in if needed is definitely recommended. What specs should I worry? Right now I aim for more lumens for less watts. I actually just released an entire video on this, what to look for when purchasing an LED grow light. I sat down with Austin from Chill Tech and we talked about a bunch of different things that you can look for when buying these LED grow lights. Um, to sum things up, I personally look for PAR first. I wanna make sure that the grow light is emitting enough PAR for that space. Then I like to factor in efficiency, light spread across the footprint. There are a lot more things that you can look at when buying an LED grill light. So on the outro card of this video, I'll actually link that video with Austin from Chill Tech. So those of you who are new to LED grill lights, you wanna find out what to look for, uh, what to look out for when it comes to LED grill lights, you can click on that video to watch that and learn more about it. I hope you enjoyed the questions that I have for you today. A lot of good ones were asked here. Appreciate those of you who submitted in questions. If you have questions that you want to see in a future Q&A episode, leave it down in the comment section below. One last thing to mention before I end this video, if you are new to growing, maybe on your first or second grow, I did write a book specifically for you. Here is my book. It is available on both my website and on Amazon. And this is gonna take you through the entire growing process. Uh, everything from gathering the equipment, seeds, the different stages of growth, harvest, dry, and cure. If you do end up buying it on Amazon, please leave a review on there. It is my goal to get 500 reviews. I'm so close to getting there actually after I post this video. You might have enough people to get over there and leave enough reviews to get up to 500. That would be awesome. And then from there, the goal would be to get 1,000. So <laughs> we're quite a ways away from that, but uh, I think I can get there eventually. If you enjoyed this video, please click that thumbs up and I will leave it at that. Until next time, peace.